3,000 mile review of the Michelin Cross Climate 2s. I don't know if you've seen this in any other tire reviews, but yes, I have held on to a full size spare that I wouldn't put on now with mismatching tread depths if I had an incident, but it can display to you the aging. Because the main reason I'm probably doing this is there's a lot of height, and rightfully so, with these tires regarding the traction that they hold on to throughout their lifetime. And I've had a good experience with that compared to some other tires, like on my previous first sedan, because the tread features are full depth and this, that. Well, let's take an in-depth look. 1030 seconds is what these start at. And as you can see here, 1030 seconds. But I'm thoroughly glad to see 730 seconds here on the used tires. These are tread life warranted to 60,000 miles for everybody wondering. On the outside, I still have 730 seconds. Rotate every 5,000 miles with my oil change. But let's keep in mind as I get up here, this is a 3,200 pound vehicle. Because I'm going to be replacing these around 430 seconds. A lot of people have had this hype about Michelin keeps the compound with that variable temperature adaptation the same all the way through. So these keep their snow performance much better. Yes, that is true. But let's look closely. I want to show you some things. The biting edges, look at the interlocking sipes. See these? They go back and forth. Let's go to the use. And this was already like this by 8.30 seconds. Straight sipes in the middle. Still, you get the sipes to grab moisture, helps with traction, but not like you're going to get when these tires are new. And I'll give a testimony to that. All right? So this whole thing that these tires, because I had in comments before, are good all the way to 2.30 seconds. You don't want to be doing any bad weather driving with tires that are down to 3 or under 430 seconds, guys, it's just not a good idea. When you talk about snow, any degree of ice, even st harsh standing water, it's pouring rain. Go to the rear tires, we're gonna see. 730 seconds. The inflation. Let's go to the door here, because a lot of people know this who are watching this video, but for other general public, this number here on the sidewall of the tire, the max inflation pressure, a lot of people see that number and they think, that's what I'm gonna put the tire to. This is your door jam sticker. Sometimes it's here as well, but most vehicles nowadays modern, 33 in the front on this vehicle, 32 in the rear. Hey everybody, just thought I might mention some further things for both the general public and the enthusiasts. Starting out with the sticker there, that's folks who engineered the car, they know the design, the weight distribution, everything. No need to change it, go above it, under it. That is for the optimal, best safety, performance, and tread life of your tires and you on the road. Uh, and the other thing about inflation is, run your tires at that starting door sticker literally starting in the morning when the tires are cold. Because as you're driving, especially at speeds over 30 miles an hour, tires have a lot of friction, they heat up, the air inside them expands, the pressure goes up. Whether it's outside or in your garage, don't be doing the pre-setting and matching the door sticker when you have it. Just off a highway trip, you gotta wait for the tires three or more hours, roughly on a warmer day. In the winter, it can be just as little as two hours, but if, especially in the summer, a hot, sun-glaring day, up to even five hours for the tires to be accurately cold. As for the uh, tread life noticing there of, man, 330 seconds and 30,000 miles, well, another contributing factor to that, if you will, which is part of maintenance, is having good suspension. So your struts and your shocks, and of course your vehicle's alignment, all right? You want that all in good shape, Make sure you don't have worn components. That'll do a number on your tires. For myself, another aspect of that is I'm not a harsh driver. This is a light vehicle, it's 3,200 pounds. And this engine only puts out like 150 horsepower. The torque is fairly minimal. So that torque is putting less force on the tires. You're not able to burn things as easily, spin the tires. My max highway speed, which I'm primarily on the highway, is 75 when I can tire tread life and the wearing is not a linear line really at all it can change certainly from the temperatures if you have soft winter tires well they wear out incredibly fast in the summer with the heat as the tires get further worn especially down to really six and certainly five four three thirty seconds the rubber and the compound naturally gets harder so that can actually slow down the rate 
And that leads into the matter of tires do degrade over time. I'd say there's a safety limit of five to eight years, depending on the ownership and a wide variety of circumstances. Rubber deteriorates in its quality from exposure to the oxygen, ozone, sunlight, and let alone such road stresses. There'll be signs of dry rotting, cracking, and even significant color fade. Especially if you leave your vehicle outside like I have to and the unstable temperature fluctuations, widely known across the upper United States, that is gonna speed up that process. So you're gonna be at that five year line. If you're storing tires, like you know mine with the, in the living room, that's how you want it. You want those spare tires not exposed to the temperature swings. If you don't do a lot of driving, just keep an eye on the, your tires. You look for dry rotting, cracking, like I said. The last thing you want to be having is a blowout on the highway. As for the comfort of these tires, there's a number of factors at play, and the Crosstrek itself has a nice smooth suspension to begin with. And I do have more sidewall cushion on my higher profile 215-65 setup. Now the car is a small wheelbase, so you still feel most imperfections in the road. Nonetheless, these Cross Climate 2s themselves are definitely pleasant. A nice improvement from those OEM Yokohama Geolander G91Fs. These are 16s, not the 225 slightly 10 millimeter wider tires and 55 lesser sidewall with a 17 inch rim. I've got actually secret place to go east of Fall River into the woods. You can actually do some relatively true off-roading. For someone like me, you're going to want a little more sidewall than that 55 original. Tiresize.com I think it is. And some of those websites will give you a calculator. All right. I've slightly changed my profile setup on my vehicle. What would be now the proper inflation to run? And I basically run these about the same, 33, 32. It technically tells me on the website, one lower, 32, 31. It's not gonna make a big difference, it's nothing. Gas mileage, a lot of people have their concerns because I went with a slightly narrower tire and the diameter is only smidge bigger. And this is a two liter naturally aspirated CVT. I get phenomenal gas mileage. I'm primarily on the highway. I don't really notice a difference. Other folks may pay attention more meticulously. There have been many online forms. I see people get a few miles a gallon less. You know, everything in this world is gonna have its compromises to some degree. Never had a problem balancing these. The handling, I can't really comment too accurately on handling because this Crosstrek, it's got the low center of gravity with the boxer engine despite the almost nine inches of ground clearance it handles very well it's a small wheelbase so even though I went because some people said slightly narrower on the tread width you're gonna get a little less dry handling well I came from the relatively crappy Yokohama Geo Lander OEMs that were on this I felt a tremendous increase in the handling this is the very harshest you're gonna be putting these tires on, and don't do it routinely. This tread is fairly sensitive. You don't wanna be taking these on true off-road. You can take these because they're aggressive enough in like light mud in the woods. These will do fine with you keeping your momentum on an all-wheel drive vehicle or even a front-wheel drive, light water crossings. Don't take these for the love of God to Arizona, Colorado, any place with harder surfaces that you will eat through the tread. And as I put my hand over this, it's fairly smooth. Put my hand over the new tire. The sound is about the same. Just a little note regarding the balancing experience of these tires. When I say really no problems, no problems in the form of they just needed some weights put on to get the rims perfectly even, but these are aggressive tires. You're never gonna get really any aggressive tire that just balances perfectly with the rim on its own. I've never had bad vibrations or issues where I've had to rebalance any single one of them. As for probably the elephant in the room that a lot of people wanna know is the tire noise. A lot of people look at these and they think, it's gonna be noisy, do 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 do. They're not noisy especially still down at 7.30 seconds. There's a lot of forums saying once they were worn in more at five and under 6.30 seconds, they really got noisy. You can see it in the tire rack reviews of the experiences. I am not to that point yet. Also, my tires are slightly narrower than the OEM setup on this vehicle. So that contributes further to the lack of noise. Seriously though, when I'm on the highway, I have no humming from these tires still at 7.30 seconds. They're fantastic. We'll see what happens in the future. And another thing with the Michelin's engineering was they did a round contact patch, not an even contact patch. And that, as well as the V-tread formation, kind of deflects the noise around it and underneath. One thing that happens, by the way, at times, regarding a person's experience 
in the noise category is if you leave your vehicle for a long time undriven, if weeks, you'll get these flat spots. So if you're gonna store your vehicle for a long time and not use it, purposely greatly over inflate your tires up to that maximum allowance on the sidewall number. So for instance, 45, 50 PSI, that can help alleviate the issue of creating a flat spot. If this does happen to you, most of the time, however, these aren't permanent. Getting them on the highway will regain their shape. Also, ones that are a little worse can be repaired by a tire shop. And while there are some more severe instances, most often, these are not permanent. These are directional tires, only face the V tread pattern forward. It's not like there's white lettering on one side. These tires don't come with white lettering and you want to face only. And also directional when you rotate them, just two in the front, straight to the rear. There's no crossing due to that. As for that, some people get worried. Well, that means the same tire is always doing the same turns. Are you going to get a little more wear on one side? Well, as we've seen here, good maintenance, no uneven wear with the cornerings on one side of the right facing out and the outer driver side, nothing. Jason from Engineering Explained, maybe I'll link his channel or the video. I saw it was like the fall in September to October of 2021, when I had this cross track coming my way, he did a phenomenal video. Yes, it was sponsored by Michelin. This video is not sponsored by Michelin. I can show you why. Little pebbles all the darn time. And I'll just take it out and clean it. I saw one tread block, I'm not gonna find it, that was opened a little bit. I did get a nail so far in the front right tire, but it is not rotated to where I can show you here. It went straight into the very middle of the tread. That's another thing. You get a nail in your tires, guys. If it goes straight in, not diagonally, if it goes straight into the tread and it's between this line in the middle, your mechanic can take care of it for you. It'll be good for the rest of the life of the tire. Anything into the sidewall like this, no way, no how. Sorry, you got to get a new tire. But one thing you can do, because this is an all-wheel drive vehicle, I don't want to buy four new tires. I hear anybody in the middle class. It sucks. If they're all the same because you've taken good care of them, you go on TireRack.com and order a shaved tire to the matching tread depth. It'll ship to you or you can go to the nearest tire rack place. Maybe you'll have a temporary spare on for that top full size spare. You don't want to run with a donut consistently. You'll screw up an all wheel drive system. Even a front wheel drive, I would not recommend it. Nowadays, these systems are so sensitive, these differentials. I've seen people driving conscientiously with flat tires on like a state highway i just shake my head another reason because of what i do with the volatile weather that's why i went with the more sidewall on these i get more cushion these are great jason's video obviously got my attention and i started doing my own research further youtube videos other folks thank you to them the snow is my top priority this is southern new england all right i'm laughing at myself now because anybody knows it barely snowed here in southern new england correct justin oh, oh yeah fake winter I, we get these fake winters every now and then last year though 21 to 2022 when i first had these from new year's onward i didn't think these were still going to be as good as they did when new when they were 10 30 seconds like this down to 9 30 seconds I'm going to put a link in the description below. You'll see these videos. I'll give you the visual examples, including ice, etc. We have this wicked blizzard. Be two feet of snow, 50 mile an hour winds. It's ice. It's just nasty conditions. People are going to say, it's a Subaru. It's a Subaru. Oh, who cares? It's a Subaru. Blah, blah, blah. Let me tell you, those Yokohama all seasons, junk. Like I remember a few weeks before I got these, one week actually before these arrived, dusting of snow. It was like a half an inch of snow. And I was going down just a regular neighborhood hill. I was sliding into the intersection and I started gradually. Now let's compare during a full-fledged blizzard in Plymouth, Massachusetts. It's icy. There's wildly varying amounts of drifting snow all over any non-main road. I was going through a neighborhood. I took like a little back route and there was the same kind of hill. It was even steeper. I was doing, I think, 35 miles an hour. Not a straight hill. It was winding like this. Stop sign at the bottom. No ABS at all. I literally said to myself, do I have Blizzax on the car? I literally almost thought that I had Bridgestone Blizzax winter dedicated tire. It was nuts. I am not being sponsored by Michelin. The only times I ever got stuck with these tires wasn't their own fault or Subaru's fault. It was me playing around a little too. You get a little overconfident and 
it's so white for anybody that's been out, especially during the daytime. You have those drifts that kind of like hide. You think it's a foot and a half deep in front of you, but it's two feet. I accidentally went into one. All right, some guys pushed me out, back out. But otherwise, the only other time I got stuck was when I purposely wanted to test the limits. I went into an unplowed lot and it was literally as deep as like I was like up to here, a foot and a half of snow. And actually for the first half of that lot as I went into it and it was gradually getting deeper, I was going with a good clip of momentum and the tires were doing fine. The vehicle just kept moving, but I saw it was getting deeper ahead and I decided, ooh, no, no, it's getting too deep, let me stop. And anybody who has some knowledge, that is a foolish idea, you wanna keep your momentum. During that day going in the blizzard, I went from the 32 PSI, 33, and I put the tires at 24 PSI for a slightly larger contact patch. That was one of the reasons why I made in traction that day. But there's other examples during normal inflation with these tires when they were new. Now let's talk about this past fake winter, the only time we had true snow. Justin, you drove up to Rutland, Vermont. I did the driving there. How did you feel? It wasn't a, a ton of snow, but honestly, there were times where I felt like I wasn't even driving on snow. We couldn't tell if it was treated, but there was no like true layer of ice. On it there. seemed like it was treated. It was a major highway, wasn't it? But You're going from Menden into Rutland, Vermont, with the hills past Killington Peak. Yeah. Well, we had some southern New England occasions this winter. We would get like a light amount of snow, and there would be that like untreated ice like, mm -hmm. under. And last winter, it would grip a lot better. This winter, but at least certainly before I got my vehicle's alignment done. I was sliding a little bit. It wasn't like before. It was mostly a dry summer last year. A couple harsh thunderstorms. 70 miles an hour on the highway. I use my signal. I keep space around the vehicle. And these tires just cut through the water like it was nothing. Now, a couple weeks ago, it was raining relatively hard. And there was a little standing water on the highway at 60 miles an hour. And I finally felt a little aquaplaning. I just take my foot off, coast through it, perfect traction. I just want to get rid of this myth that these tires are going to perform the same when they're worn as when new. No, that's not the truth. No tire is going to do that. Most all seasons, I call them three seasons, their compound is too hard. When it gets under 30 degrees or even under 40, it turns into a skating rink of a hockey puck. The main thing about winter tires, folks, is, yeah, you look at the tread and the sight, but the compound is equally, if not more important. You need that soft plush to grip and grab. Otherwise, you're not going anywhere. You'll slide all over the place. The all-wheel drive system, yeah. What about cornering? What about turning? What about handling? And braking is the big thing. As for more stories and testimony regarding the all-weather traction of these tires, in my experiences, the start of that blizzard day, going down to Plymouth, highway is coated in snow for the most part with just like the wind blown drift gaps. Doing 50 to 60 miles an hour, I was, comfortably. In the heart of the blizzard, the only sliding I had of any sort of loss of traction during genuine driving was just left turns at intersections in the harshest winter conditions. Also, I might as well point out that I did have relatively all new brake pads and rotors on the car. As for when I got stuck, 146 in the blizzard, storm chase highlights clip, I was not gonna be doing that there foolishly with the unplowed lot. If I didn't know that the front end loader guys, they weren't there, I wouldn't be doing that. They're the ones who got me out. And the interesting thing about it was, for those who have been high centered, your vehicle is just in an awful position. And in terms of my own brain fart, if you will, you can't fix stupid, I guess. I didn't turn the traction control off. Probably could have just had that off, kept my momentum going through. I wasn't able to start rocking back and forth until I got out myself and aired down the tires further. But even when I was able to rock back and forth because it was harder and wetter the nature of the snow there is just for a two liter boxer four cylinder naturally aspirated you're not going to be able to push it down with this vehicle it's not like you got a mid-sized truck or a tacoma or a tundra or a nissan titan you know you're not going to be able to shove through that snow once the front end loader guys just moved it all and i just had a little pile in front of the bumper the tires had their good traction again and also, this vehicle, it's a CVT, it doesn't have any actual drive gears, but there is a fake manual mode with paddle shifters. I could have just used those, put them in the lower settings, and tried that. I also did not have my own set of traction boards yet, definitely should have. But the biggest twist to it all was I forgot about my shovel when I lended it to a man in Plymouth with his front wheel drive SUV with three season tires on. 
in the plaza up there when he was trying to get out of there and get going. And I was so focused on what I was doing and my documentation and work that yes, I accidentally left it behind there. Now before this car, I used to have a sedan and it was, believe it or not, only 300 pounds lighter than this. I put in winter 2020 to 2021, February onwards, fully dedicated winter tires on just the front two drive wheels of that vehicle. I kept the three seasons as I like to call them saloons on the rear. So there's a lot of variability in the scenario, but if I were to compare my Michelin Cross Climate 2's experience, yeah, it's a Subaru and all wheel drive, the ground clearance, nine inches versus six and a half inches. But I think the Michelins were a little bit better, which is quite the testimony to them themselves versus a fully dedicated master craft glacier tracks and deep snow. They're wildly different vehicles. I can't really compare. I wasn't purposely going in as deep of snow. The harshest winter storm, if you will, those tires went through was probably only half as harsh as the nor'easter blizzard day on the Subaru with these tires. As for the pricing, the Michelin Cross Climate 2s, go online, go on TireRack.com, any website, you're going to see, oh man, they're more expensive. Yeah, they are, but it's about the value and the retention of the traction and all-weather performance life. In comparison, I had Pirelli Key 4 Seasons Plus on my Sentra. They were just as good in the rain to start as these. Just the front two drive wheels, you just couldn't make them slip in the rain unless you were flat out reckless. The traction on those started disappearing way faster than these. And a lot of that has to do with on most tires, they put that special silica softer compound for gripping in the rain and the snow only on the top layer, like maybe the maximum, 4 30 seconds. And in addition, let's not forget the indirect price that you have to pay with regular tires for when you're swapping on winter tires. The separate price of those and the balancing and mounting, that's going to easily cancel out the price difference without question. As for a final story on Michelin's quality of engineering, I once had a faulty valve stem fall out of a wheel on the highway starting at a little over 60 miles per hour. I gradually slowed down and safely got off conveniently just around the corner to a dealership. There was zero damage to that tire, including the bead. Just replace the valve stem and reinflated. And lastly, would I buy these tires again? It's kind of a conflicting argument for me in terms of the traction focus of these with the all weather. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, 1000% I would. But the fact that I go to the soft roading with the gravel rail bed here and there and these tires don't like that is not necessarily ideal. So what I'm going to be focusing on for my next set of tires, I might go to an all-terrain, like a mild all-terrain. At most, a little more aggressive all-terrain, like the General Grabber ATX or the Falcon Wild Peak AT3Ws, more milder all-terrain Falcon Wild Peak AT Trail. Those three tires, what do they have in common? They have excellent winter subjective and objective reviews. That is where I'm aiming roughly, but I still might get these tires again. So these are actually in the all-weather designation. I gotta say, Bridgestone makes good all-weather tires now. They have the weather peaks out. These are still leading the class since they came out a few years ago. They're so popular, I see them everywhere and demand. I've gone on TireRack.com and I think middle of last year I saw, sorry, out of stock for that size. Tires just keep getting better. It's amazing the technology out there. Feel free to subscribe, hit that like button, and leave your own thoughts. Thank you.